Volume 2 Chapter 10 Topics Tilden's Last Days The Books He Read His Death Whittier's Elegiac Verses The Funeral Mr. Tilden's Will The Validity of the Tilden Will Contested The Trustees of the Tilden Trust Purchase a Half Interest in the Estate James's C. Carter's Argument Provisions made by the legislature and afterwards withdrawn for the Tilden Free Library. During the winter and spring of 1886 Mr. Tilden's infirmities had been gaining so rapidly upon him that when the warm weather arrived he was capable of scarcely more physical exertion than an infant. He could not endure the jar of the carriage which bore him to his yacht, and even went so far as to have plans drawn for a railway from his house to the river that he might reach his yacht without exertion. He had a carriage made expressly with extra springs and cushions in which to take the air with the least possible fatigue. He had not been to his city home for many months, and had abandoned all expectation of seeing it or the city again. He spent most of his waking hours and many of nearly every night, after vainly courtly sleep, extended upon a couch reading, or rather in being read to, for his hands had long ceased to retain sufficient prehensile power to hold a volume, nor could he without great difficulty, even turn its leaves. The luxury of conversation was practically denied to him, for his articulation, for many months never rising above a whisper, had become so indistinct that none but those in pretty constant attendance upon him could understand much, if anything, he said. He felt this privation intensely, for it compelled him to refuse himself to many visitors whose conversation he would have greatly enjoyed, and destroyed much of the pleasure he felt entitled to from those he did receive. This cut off from intercourse with the living, he indemnified himself as well as he could by cultivating a more familiar intercourse with the dead. In the earlier and active portions of his life he had not been a wide reader. He had been in the habit of educating himself and fixing his opinions more from conversations than from books. He devoured books by the hecatomb, as much to distract his attention from his physical troubles as to increase his stock of knowledge. The books he most affected were of a biographical and historical character. He did not care for poetry, nor much for fiction, still less for books of metaphysics or natural science. During the last six or seven years of his life, when not otherwise engaged, it was his habit to have John Cahill, one of his clerks, or Miss Gould, a sister of his brother Henry's widow, who had become a member of his family, to read to him more or less every day, and not unfrequently at night after he retired. Miss Gould, who kept a careful list, informed me that she herself had read to him during the last four years of his life the contents of eight hundred volumes, besides magazines and newspapers. Though not a book collector in the ordinary sense, Mr. Tilden had a very fastidious taste for books, which he indulged without much regard to expense. His library numbered some 15,000 volumes. Though the larger part of them were of the class, which no gentleman's library is complete without, there were also among them a very considerable number of the most rare and costly publications of the world, now in commerce. He bought books for his immediate use and enjoyment, and apparently with no thought of collection a library that should be complete in any department, always excepting his law library, which was one of the most complete in the country up to the time of his withdrawal from the active practice of his profession. His illustrated and extra-illustrated books, upon which he lavished money without stint, would add distinction to any private library in this country, perhaps in any other. He was for many years one of the most valuable clients of M. J. W. Boughton and accomplished Bibliopole of New York, through whom he purchased the greater part of his more rare and costly works. Author note, I am indebted to Miss Gould for a list of these books and a note accompanying it, which will be found in Appendix C, to Mr. Tilden a number of books not noted on Miss Gould's list, among which he remembers Burns' Prose Writings, Irving's Life of Washington, which greatly interested him, and Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, for the style of which he frequently expressed admiration. The titles of some of these acquisitions will give the reader an idea of the value and character of the collection. 1. Baron Taylor's Voyages Pitteresques et Romantiques Don Lancy in France. The copy is complete and perfect in every respect, 
and comprise 27 large folio volumes, containing about 5,000 plates executed in lithography after original sketches by the best artists of France. All the great buildings and monuments of the different departments of France are represented here, with details and sections. Much of the text is printed with elaborate ornamental borders adorned with medallion portraits of celebrated personages, arms and armor, figures, views, etc. Baron Taylor, who projected this work, was the man who brought the obelisk of Luxor from Egypt to Paris and erected it on the Place de la Concorde. He was also for many years at the head of the Théâtre Français. The publication was commenced in 1820, and continued through the ensuing years till its completion in 1878. It was issued to subscribers in parts, of which there were in all 1,000, at 12 and a half franc apiece, making the price of the whole 12,500 francs. The complete sets of this work in this country can be counted on one man's fingers, very few of the original subscribers having outlived the six decades taken for its publication, and but a few of the original subscription sets have ever been offered for sale. 2. Piranesi's works illustrating the antiquities, monuments, architecture, etc., of the Romans. This splendid set, comprising 35 volumes, is bound in 23 large folio volumes, containing nearly a thousand large etched plates. Some of the folding plates open 10 feet in length. 3. Gilray's Drawing and Caricatures, nearly if not quite the only complete collection in existence. It comprises a series of 831 caricatures, all original issues and the larger portion in colors, 156 original drawings, 19 miscellaneous engravings, and 4 autographed letters, the whole in 8 folio volumes, sumptuously bound in crimson Morocco by Riviere. Upwards of 250 of the subjects have never been catalogued or indexed in any work. The collection was formed by an English gentleman who spent five years in its formation. In 1866 he obtained the collection of Gilray's belonging to the Marquis of Bath, and subsequently added to it that of Lord Farnham and another private collection. To these three collections were added from time to time, as opportunity offered, many other rare prints. Gilray's are among the scarcest of autographs. There are four in this collection. For Audubon's Bird, the Great Folio Edition. This was bought of Mr. Bowden from the family of one of the original subscribers, in the original parts, unbound. It contains 435 very large copper plates, colored by hand, including about 1,000 figures of birds, from drawings made by Audubon from nature during many years' sojourn in the wilds of America. The set was then bound to order for Mr. Tilden in half Morocco, uncut edges, and is unquestionable one of the finest copies in existence. The plate depicting the turkey, which Dr. Franklin recommended instead of the eagle as our national emblem, one of the largest in the work, and usually found with half the head cut off, is in this copy perfect. 5. Audubon's Quadrupeds, three volumes, folio, also an original subscriber's copy, and bound to order for Mr. Tilden from the original parts. This is almost equal in rarity to the birds. It consists of 150 very large and beautifully colored engravings, depicting the animals mostly in their natural sizes, male and female, with their very young, prey, and views of their favorite haunts and localities. This collection also contains a copy of the original Octavo edition of Audubon's Birds, in seven volumes, together with the three volumes Octavo of Quadrupeds, issued by Audubon in conjunction with Dr. Bachman. 6. The First Folio, Shakespeare, London, 1623, bound in full red Morocco extra by de Coverley. 7. The Second Folio, Shakespeare, London, 1632, also bound in full Morocco by de Coverley. 8. A fine copy of the third folio, Shakespeare, London, 1664, handsomely bound in full red Morocco extra by Francis Bedford. 9. A set of Ashby's facsimiles, of the Shakespeare quartos, traced letter by letter from original copies to ensure accuracy, 
something which it is asserted has not been altogether secured in the Griggs photolithographic facsimiles more recently published. Of this series there were but 50 sets, and of these sets 19 were destroyed, only 31 sets being preserved as satisfactory in every respect. Each copy is certified to buy the signatures of E. W. Ashby and J. O. Halliwell. 10. A copy of Halliwell's Shakespeare, in 16 folio volumes, containing in addition to the great playwright's works the literary sources to which the great dramatist was supposed to be under obligation, each play being accompanied by used literary and antiquarian illustrations, copious philological notes, complete reprints of all novels, tales, or dramas on which it is founded, including many other documents of a strictly illustrative character. There are besides numerous wood engravings and facsimiles. But 150 copies were printed. 11. Purchase, Pilgrims, 5 volumes, folio, a fine tall copy of this old collection of voyages, dated 1625, the best edition, clean and perfect, with a fine impression of the rare frontispiece, obtained a copy of the second edition of the first volume of Purchase, printed in 1614. 12. An early copy of Dr. Robertson's historical works, large paper, 12 volumes, quarto, in contemporary old red Morocco, with a large number of rare old prints inserted, and most of which at this day it would be difficult, if not impossible, to duplicate. This is one of the earliest specimens of extra illustrations. 13. Hudibras, the best edition, edited by Dr. Nash, three volumes, quarto, large paper, with Indian proof of the plates, numerous extra plates inserted, substantially bound in full red morocco. 14. A magnificent copy of Cromwelliana, the folio volume extended and inlaid to five volumes, imperial folio, and about 1,000 extra portraits and engravings inserted, many of which are of extreme rarity, including, among others, an extraordinary assemblage of portraits of Cromwell, of his family, of Charles I, and of James I and James II. 15. A sumptuous copy of Mrs. Bray's Life of Thomas Stothard, R.A., her father, the little quarto inlaid to folio size and extended to three volumes by the insertion of several hundred plates, handsomely bound in full red Morocco extra. 16. A copy of Thompson's Seasons, Bentley's fine edition in large type, imperial folio, with exquisite engravings by Bertolazzi, full green Morocco. This copy has a large number of extra plates inserted. 17. A collection of caricatures got together by Horace Walpole, comprising 137 plates of Gilray and others, relating to Walpole and his times, bound in full blue Morocco, elephant folio in size. 18. A select collection of humorous caricatures of a miscellaneous character collected by Thomas Maclean, comprising several hundred large plates colored by hand, unique. Elephant folio, bound in full Morocco. 19. A copy of the first edition of Milton's Paradise Lost, small quarto, calf, gilt, London, 1669. It is a perfect copy, with what Lowndes terms a seventh title page. This copy formerly belonged to Blakeway, the historian of Shrewsbury, and bears his autograph. 20. A copy of the third edition, 1678, of Paradise Lost, bound up with a copy of the first edition of Paradise Regained. 1680. 21. A small quarto volume of Milton's Plagiarisms, a highly interesting volume, containing Lauder's two tracts on Milton's Plagiarisms, 1650-51, Dr. Douglas, Expo of Lauder, 1756, Lauder's Recantation and Confession, drawn up by Dr. Johnson, with an original autograph letter of Lauder to Dr. Mead, never published, two original autograph letters of Salmagius, portraits, etc. The volume came from the library of Mr. Dillon. An account of this controversy is to be found in Boswell's Johnson. 22. The Milton Memorial, consisting of a collection of early tracts, proof portraits of Milton, with autograph letters of his various editions, etc. 23. An elaborately illustrated copy of Kiesler's Travels Through Germany, etc., the four volumes, quarto, 
extended to eight thick volumes, royal folio, 2,000 rare and curious plates, portraits, views, maps, etc., and bound in half Russia, uncut edges. 24. A superb set of the Abbotsford edition of the Waverley novels, the twelve royal octavo volumes extended to forty-four by the insertion of several thousand fine plates illustrative of these works, and several autograph letters of Scott, Lockhart, and other contemporary notabilities. The copy was illustrated by a gentleman of wealth and taste for his own amusement, and occupied his leisure hours for many years. Sudden business reverses forced him to sell, and Mr. Bowden became its purchaser. From him it passed into Mr. Tilden's collection. The set is probably the richest and finest ever made. The forty-four volumes are handsomely bound in dark blue crushed Levant Morocco, elegantly tooled, by Matthews. 25. The Boydell edition of Milton's works, three volumes, folio, extended to eight volumes by the addition of several thousand engravings, handsomely bound in Morocco Extra by R. W. Smith. This set is without doubt the most elaborately extra-illustrated copy of Milton's works in the world. 26. Doran's Annals of the Stage, a larger paper copy of Middleton's handsome edition in two volumes, Imperial Octavo, extended to four volumes by the addition of portraits of celebrated actors and actresses. The volumes are handsomely bound in dark blue Morocco by Matthews. 27. Moore's Life Letters and Journals of Lord Byron, two volumes, quarto, extended to four by the insertion of choice plates. 28. Boswell's Johnson, Murray's Royal Octavo Edition, extended to six volumes by the addition of a profusion of beautiful engravings illustrating the life and time of famous lexicographer. 29. Walpoliana, in five volumes, folio, bound in half-red Morocco, with a large number of portraits, views, facsimiles, etc., relating to Horace Walpole and his contemporaries. 30. The old quarto edition of Hudibras, edited by Dr. Nash, of which but 200 copies were printed, extended from three to six volumes by the addition of a host of fine engravings extracted from other editions. 31. Duikink's Cyclopedia of American Literature, the large paper edition printed on a hand press by William Alvord, with special view to the needs of extra illustrators, and increased in thickness as much again by the insertion of portraits, view, etc., of celebrated authors, and localities connected with them. 32. The New Testament, in French, issued by Hatchet and Company, of Paris, illustrated by a series of beautiful etchings done by Beda after sketches made by himself in the Holy Land, in two volumes folio. 33. Musée Napoleon, in eleven volumes, quarto, a large paper copy, with proofs before letters, with the scarce supplementary volume, which is uniform in size, and not inlaid as is usually the case. This fine work is the only one containing reproductions of all the pictures selected and appropriated by Napoleon from the principal art galleries of Europe, and transferred to Paris, where they were engraved by his command. 34. Layard's Monuments of Nineveh, comprising 170 large and curious outlines, tinted plates, on large paper, both series, in two imperial folio volumes, bound in half Morocco. 35. I.L. Vaticano, by Pistolisi, eight volumes, large folio, containing over 800 fine outline engravings. 36. Rejected Addresses, fourth edition, inlaid, folio size, and extra illustrated, and bound in maroon Morocco. 37. Matthias, Pursuits of Literature, 1812, a copy on largest paper, with about 100 fine portraits of celebrities inserted, folio, half Morocco. 38. Ticknor's Life of Prescott, Quarto, 1866, large paper, extended to three volumes by the addition of engravings. 39. Parton's Life of Franklin, two volumes, imperial octavo, large paper, extended to four by the insertion of plates, bound in green morocco. 40. Hogarth's, engravings, in three volumes, folio, containing a fine early impression of the plates. 41. A choice collection of Crookshankiana, 
formed by a friend of Crook Shank who enjoyed unusual opportunities for collecting in this line. It formed six volumes, folio, bound in Morocco. 42. A large paper copy of a beautiful edition of Don Quixote, printed throughout on Watman paper, with etchings by Lalaz, in three states, of which but fifty copies were printed, published by William Patterson, of Edinburgh, in 1879. This is the handsomest edition of this celebrated book yet published. 43. Charles Leblanc's Catalogue of Rembrandt's Etchings, last edition, one of the twenty copies printed on Watman paper, with the plates in three states. 44. Maximilian's Travels in the Interior of North America, a folio volume, containing eighty fine tinted plates after original drawings, with a quarto volume of text in English. 45. A proof edition of L'Art, printed on Holland paper, with duplicate proofs on Japanese paper, from its commencement in 1875, the etchings being of the best French artists. There were four volumes to the year, folio size, each year containing 52 full-page etchings. Thanks to Mr. Bowden, Mr. Tilden was one of the early subscribers to this precious publication. 46. A proof copy of the Musée Française, in five volumes, folio, with about 400 fine, large copperplate engravings of the masterpieces of the great painters, the finest collection of pictures ever got together, a presentation copy to one of Napoleon's marshals. 47. The Musée Borbonico, in sixteen quarto volumes, containing about one thousand beautiful engravings of ancient art unearthed at Pompeii, Herculaneum, etc. 48. Dramatic Biographies, twenty-four volumes, octavo, with numerous plates inserted. 49. Oratory and Gesture, by J. Sheridan Knowles, privately printed for the late James McHenry, by whom it was presented to Mr. Tilden. It is an imperial quarto, bound in red crimped Morocco by Riviere. The date is 1873. 50. Actors and Actresses, a magnificent volume, enriched with the choicest portraits in the finest possible state, nearly all open letter of India proof impressions, collected, without regard to expense, by Sir Charles Price. The volume is superbly bound in full Morocco by Riviere. The date is 1873. 51. The Pilkington's Dictionary of Engravers, Old Edition, 805, a unique copy, copiously illustrated with many hundred fine and rare prints, etchings, original drawings, etc., bound in pale old Russia, the two volumes, quarto, extended to four. 52. A remarkable collection of books of scenery, 33 volumes, quarto, 1816-1835, issued in parts by subscription, illustrated with fine engravings on steel. 53. A large paper copy of Lodge's, Portraits, 12 volumes bound in six, quarto, India proofs of the portraits, bound in full Morocco. 54. Pickering's beautiful edition of Isaac Walton, 1836, edited by Sir Harris Nicholas, with fine steel engravings, India proof copy, also a copy of Zucca's Life of Walton, 1823, large paper, with some extra plates inserted mostly India proof, quarto, bound in green Morocco extra chasseline. 55. A remarkable collection of works on folklore, 46 volumes in all, including many works now rare. 56. Speeches of celebrated parliamentary orators, in all 49 volumes. 57. Jesse's works, in 23 volumes, handsomely bound in tree calf. 58. The works of Charles Dickens, printed at the Riverside Press, large paper, the handsomest edition ever printed in this country. 59. Large paper copies of Massinger's, dramatic works, in four volumes, 1813, of Middleton's, dramatic works, in five volumes, 1840, and of Ford's, dramatic works, in three volumes, 1869. 60. Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament, the fine folio edition of 1856, containing 100 superb colored plates. 61. A large paper set of the Gallery de Versailles, in 19 imperial folio volumes, illustrating the history of France to the time of Louis Philippe. 
62, the Florence Gallery, four volumes, folio, 1739, proofs before letters of the superb plates. 63, the Gallery du Palais Royal, three volumes, folio, half Morocco containing 355 copper plate engravings of the pictures of the celebrated collection of the Duke of Orleans. 64, a colored copy of the Stafford Gallery, four volumes, imperial folio, bound in full red Morocco. 65, Finden's Royal Gallery, India proofs of the plates, folio, full Morocco. 66, a large paper copy of the Turner Gallery, containing 60 exquisite engravings on steel of the masterpiece of England's greatest painter. 67, a proof copy of the Logia of Raphael, Imperial Folio, Mulamister, Half Red Morocco. 68, Tableaux Historiques, Original Issue, Three Volumes, Royal Folio, Red Morocco. 69, one volume of the personal expense accounts of President Jefferson, a detailed description of which appeared in the Century magazine a few years prior to Mr. Tilden's death. One of his few subsidiary diversions during the winter of 1885-86 was the compilation of the genealogical notes of the Tilden family, to which reference is made in the early part of this work. It was the fruit of considerable labor, covering, as it did, the history of a family life on two continents, and a period of over three centuries. It was finished during the week in which he died. Not to speak of the considerable expense necessarily incurred for the printed and manuscript records which had to be acquired and consulted, these notes are another striking illustration of the thoroughness with which he executed everything he undertook, and which no degree of physical weakness could ever make him relax. He now rarely saw strangers. He had long ceased to join his family at the table, taking his meals alone in his library. Requiring to be fed by an attendant, he naturally was averse to having witnesses to the ceremony. He had lost almost entirely the use of one arm, he rarely walked alone more than four or five rods at a time, and then with a shuffling gait which betrayed an impaired control of his lower limbs. I visited Greystone on the 17th of July 1886, and spent the Sabbath with him. We rode out together in the afternoon. I had to do most of the talking, for the effort to make himself intelligible was painful and rarely successful. He frequently called my attention to the scenery, for he had a lively sensibility for the beauties of nature. I had recently returned from Philadelphia, where I had been inspecting the collection of Franklin manuscripts in the Pennsylvania Historical Society for a new edition of the works of Franklin, which I was engaged. We discussed a scheme, to which he had already given some attention, for procuring copies of valuable manuscripts for his library. Before we separated Monday he said that if I would organize such a work he would not mind the expense of it. I promised him when I returned to town with my family to discuss the matter further with him. On Monday morning before I left he read me the following letter which he had been writing in reply to an invitation to attend the celebration of the 200th anniversary of the granting of a charter to the city of Albany. Tilden to the Albany Reception Committee. Greystone, Yonkers, New York, July 19, 1886. Gentlemen, I have to thank you for your invitation to assist in commemorating the 200th anniversary of the granting of a charter to the city of Albany. I regret that I cannot be personally present at the ceremonies so worthy of your ancient and renowned municipality. Albany is a historic city, and has long occupied a prominent place in the annals of the state and nation. It was the scene of the early struggles which determined where the colonization of the vast country tributary to it should be of a Dutch or English type. Albany formed a center of the great natural highways, connecting on the south by the majestic and placid Hudson with the Atlantic Ocean, on the north by Lake Champlain with the waters of the St. Lawrence, and on the west by the great plateau that stretches to Lake Erie. It thus became the objective point in military operations during the protracted contests for supremacy upon this continent between England and France, and afterwards between England and the rising Republic of the United States. The same geographical configuration which caused it to be a strategical point of such importance made it afterwards the gateway of a continental commerce. It was Albany which, 
20 years before the Declaration of Independence, was the seat of the first conference looking to the formation of a union between what afterwards became the independent states of America. It is eminently fit that by such a celebration as you propose, the momentous events with which Albany has been associated should be kept in the memory of the present generation and of posterity. S. J. Tilden To Robert Lennox Banks, James H. Manning, John C. Knott, Louis Boss, Archibald McClure, Samuel B. Towner, William Bayard Van Rensselaer, Augustus Whitman, John Zimmerman, James Otis Woodward, Reception Committee. When I took leave of him he showed unusual emotion, and expressed some disappointment. He spoke of several things of which he would like to talk with me when I returned. Had not my duty to my family imperatively required it, I should not then have left him. Just two weeks and two days from the day we parted at Greystone, and on the 4th of August, I received the following telegram from Mr. G. W. Smith, his secretary. Mr. Tilden died this morning at 8. In spite of the fact that Mr. Tilden had been an invalid for many years, and his death at any moment not improbable, the intelligence was a surprise and shock to the nation. So long a time had elapsed since his physical infirmities had become notorious, that they had come to be regarded as one of the conditions of life with him. Besides, his feebleness, which was physical only, was not apparent to the public, while his unimpaired intellectual activity in his active solicitude about public affairs gave no premonitions of decay. His death was equally unexpected by his physicians, two of whom were present at his bedside when his great spirit went its way. As soon as the news reached the city, the flags on all the public buildings and most of the newspaper offices were displayed at half-mast. Governor Hill proclamation in which, among other things, he said, the country loses one of its ablest statesmen and the state of New York one of its foremost citizens. He was twice a representative in the state legislature, a member of two constitutional conventions, governor of the state for two years, and in 1876 was the candidate of one of the greater parties of the country for the presidency, and received therefore the electoral vote of his native state, and upon the popular votes as declared the choice of a majority of the voters of the United States. As a private citizen and in every public station he was pure and upright, and discharged every trust with conspicuous fidelity. His last public utterance, which attracted universal attention, exhibited the same spirit of unselfish patriotism which characterized his whole career, and was in behalf of strengthening the defenses of his country that he loved so well. The governor then ordered the flags upon the capital and upon all the public buildings of the state, including arsenals of the National Guard, to be displayed at half-mast until and including the day of the funeral, and the citizens of the state, for a like period, were requested to unite in appropriate tokens of respect. President Cleveland telegraphed to the family his, individual sorrow in an event by which the state of New York had lost her most distinguished son, and the nation one of its wisest and most patriotic counselors. The funeral was solemnized at Greystone, on the 7th of August, and the same day the remains of the deceased statesman were conveyed to New Lebanon, where, after a supplementary funeral service in the Presbyterian church of that village, they were interred near those of his deceased kindred. Whittier, the poet, found in Mr. Tilden's death a theme for the following noble lines. Once more. O oh, all-adjusting death, the nation's pantheon opens wide. Once more a common sorrow saith, a strong, wise man has died. Faults doubtless had he. Had we not our own, to question and asperse the worth we doubled or forgot until we stood beside his hearse? Ambitious, cautious, yet the man to strike down fraud with resolute hand, a patriot, if a partisan he loved his native land. So let the morning bells be rung, the banner droop its folds halfway, and let the public pen and tongue their fitting tribute pay. Then let us vow above is beer to set our feet on party lies, and wound no more a living ear with words that death denies. On the Monday following the funeral Mr. Tilden's will, which had been executed on the 23rd of April 1884, was opened and read in the presence of the heirs and the executors, by James C. Carter, E.S.Q., of the law firm of Carter and Ledger, and it was admitted to probate by the surrogate of Westchester country, 
in October of the year 1886. The testator, never having married, had no direct descendants. His surviving next of kin consisted of his sister, Mrs. Mary B. Pelton, and the two sons and four daughters of his brother Henry. His estate consisted chiefly of personal property, about one-tenth in houses and lands, and another tenth in iron mines in New York and Michigan. The estate was appraised by experts at a little over five millions. Of this about one million was appropriated to legacies and to the constitution of trust funds for relatives and other beneficiaries. His will provided for the establishment of free libraries at New Lebanon and Yonkers, at the cost of somewhat beyond $100,000 and set apart $10,000 for keeping repairs, improving, and adorning the cemetery in the town of New Lebanon. The substantial residue of his estate, amounting to about $4 million he disposed of as follows. 35th Clause. I request my said executors and trustees to obtain as speedily as possible from the legislator an act of incorporation of an institution to be known as the Tilden Trust, with capacity to establish and maintain a free library and reading room in the city of New York, and to promote such scientific and educational objects as my said executors and trustees may more particularly designate. Such corporation shall have not less than five trustees, with power to fill vacancies in their number, and in case said institution shall be incorporated in a form and manner satisfactory to my said executors and trustees during the lifetime of the survivor of the two lives in being upon which the trust of my general estate herein created is limited to, to wit, the lives of Ruby S., Tilden and Susan Whittlesey. I hereby authorize my said executors and trustees to organize the said corporation, designate the first trustees thereof, and to convey to or apply to the use of the same, the rest, residue, and remainder of all my real and personal estate not specifically disposed of by this instrument. Or so much thereof as they may deem expedient, but subject, nevertheless, to the special trusts herein directed to be constituted for particular persons, and to the obligations to make and keep good the said special trusts, provided that the said corporation shall be authorized by law to assume such obligation. But in case such institution shall not be so incorporated, during the lifetime of the survivor of the said Ruby S., Tilden and Susan Whittlesey, or if for any cause or reason my said executors and trustees shall deem it inexpedient to convey said rest, residue, and remainder or any part thereof or to apply the same or any part thereof to the said institution. I authorize my said executors and trustees to apply the rest, residue, and remainder of my property, real and personal, after making good the said special trusts herein directed to be constituted, or such portions thereof as they may not deem it expedient to apply to its use. To such charitable educational and scientific purposes as in the judgment of my said executors and trustees will render the said rest, residue, and remainder of my property most widely and substantially beneficial to the interests of mankind. The executors and trustees named in the will were John Bigelow, Andrew H. Green, and George W. Smith. In pursuance of the directions contained in the foregoing clause the executors applied to the legislature of the state of New York for an act of incorporation of an institution to be known as the Tilden Trust. And on the 26th day of March, 1877, the legislature passed, an act to incorporate the Tilden Trust for the establishment and maintenance of a free library and reading room in the city of New York. In pursuance of the terms of their charter the executors designated and appointed in writing Alexander E. Oren Stephen A. Walker as the two other trustees of such corporation, on the 26th days of April, 1887. The establishment of a free library in the city of New York, with an endowment of between three and four millions of dollars, was regarded as a most becoming crown to a life of which so large a portion had been consecrated to public uses. The hopes, however, which had been awakened throughout the nation by the publication of the will, were destined to be only partially realized. The nephews of Mr. Tilden, who were largely in debt, were pressed by their creditors to contest the validity of the above-cited 35th clause of the will, and proceedings were instituted for that purpose in the Supreme Court of New York on the very day the will was admitted to probate. The ground taken by Messrs. Vanderpool, 
Green, and Cumming, of counsel for the heirs, was that the 35th clause was invalid for indefiniteness of subject, in failing to specify with sufficient precision the portions of that residency estate to be appropriated to the several objects of his bounty. The case came on for trial before Justice Lawrence at special term, Joseph H. Choate and Delos McCurdy, of counsel for the heirs, and James C. Carter, Lewis Cass Ledgerd, and Daniel Rollins, of counsel for the executors, in November, 1888. At the January special term of the Supreme Court in 1889 Mr. Justice Lawrence rendered a decision sustaining the validity of the contested clause. The plaintiffs appealed to the general term of the Supreme Court, where Chief Justice Van Brunt and Associate Justices Brady and Daniels reversed the decision of Judge Lawrence by a vote of two to one. Jude Daniels voting and writing an opinion in defense of it, and Judges Van Brunt and Brady writing opinions for reversal. Judge Brady's opinion is so unique a specimen of juridical literature, that no one will think the space it will occupy in these pages disproportioned to its value. The questions discussed by the presiding Justice and Justice Daniels are not free from difficulty or doubt, but I think, on authority and proper judicial interpretation, the solution of them by the presiding Justice is the most acceptable. I concur with him, therefore. The case was taken to the Court of Appeals, where it came on for argument before the Second Division, consisting of seven judges of the Supreme Court temporarily designated by Governor Hill to assist the appellate court in disposing of business in arrear. It was argued by Carter and Rollins for the appellants and by Choate and McCurdy for the heirs, at the June term in 1891. Mr. Carter's argument closed with the following impressive appeal. Now then, if your honors please, I have gone over, so far as I have had strength, the principal grounds upon which the validity of this device has been contested. They are, to my mind, unsubstantial in the extreme. Nothing but the circumstance, that it seems to be impossible nowadays for a man to make any considerable disposition of property outside of the range of those who claim to be kindred by blood, nothing but the disposition to question bequests given to public objects, to take the chances of litigation, because so many of those contests have been successful, nothing, I say, but this practice, which has become too universal, would have ever induced any one to question the simple provisions of this. Will. If I could persuade myself that this munificent bequest of Governor Tilden, this beneficent design so constantly associated with his thoughts in the closing years of his life, stood in any sort of hazard, I should be affected with the deepest anxiety. The idea that a man cannot, when it comes to step from this mortal scene, or make his preparations for stepping from it, look about him and see what he can do with his wealth which fortune has been pleased to grant him. That he cannot do that without apprehension that somebody who has some connection with him, near or remote, by blood, will come into a court of justice and defeat all his beneficent intentions, is to me a circumstance of a most melancholy nature. And that these people who contest this will, of all others, should be permitted to grasp this property, no near relations of the testator, with no near ties, either of blood or affection, living upon his bounty while he was alive, taking a million from him when he died, and all without a word of gratitude. And even then they would not let him rear that monument to his name, which was the dearest wish of his closing hours. I take it that there is to be no decision here which will prevent, I am glad to believe that there is no doctrine of law which prevents the full accomplishment of his benevolent purpose. Note, the opinion of Judge Van Brunt, who at this time had become Chief Justice, lends a melancholy interest to the circumstance that it was a special instance and request of Aaron J., Vanderpool, Green, and Cumming, the counsel for the contestants of the will, that Judge Van Brunt, while a judge of the Court of Common Pleas, was detailed by Governor Tilden to act as a supplementary judge of the Supreme Court in 1874 a detail which was continued for six out of the eight succeeding years, when he was elected one of the justices of that court. It was in his opinion, perhaps, which inspired the wags of the bar to exclaim, when Judge Brady entered the courtroom. Lo, the concurring hero comes. On the 28th of October the Court of Appeals sustained the decision of the Supreme Court in bank, holding that the 35th clause of the will was invalid, 
and that all the residuary estate covered by that clause vested in the heirs at law on the death of the testator, Judge Brown writing the opinion of the court, in which Chief Judge Follett and Judges Haight and Parker concurred. Judge Bradley wrote an opinion sustaining the validity of the 35th clause, in which Judges Potter and Van concurred. In his opinion Judge Brown rested the decision of the court upon a point which had not been taken by counsel for the heirs, and which, therefore, the counsel for the appellants had had no occasion to discuss. As that ground was deemed entirely indefensible by Mr. Carter, as the case had been decided, not by the regular judges of the Court of Appeals, but by judges of the Supreme Court set apart by the governor temporarily to hear appeals, as two of the judges in the courts below were for sustaining the will to four against it, in other words, as the case in the three hearings had been heard only by Supreme Court judges, five of which were for sustaining the will and only six opposed, Mr. Carter felt that he was entitled to an opportunity of re-arguing the case for the purpose of discussing the new point raised by Mr. Justice Brown. In this view the executors and the trustees of the Tilden Trust concurred. This motion, that which none could have been more reasonable, if a re-argument is ever reasonable in any case, and though not frequent there is no lack of precedence for them, the court promptly denied, the same members voting against the re-argument as had voted to invalidate the 35th clause, and those two had voted to sustain the will, with the exception of Judge Potter, who had ceased to be a member of the court voting in favor of a re-argument. Whatever may be the merits or the demerits of the decision of the Court of the Opinion of Judge Brown, the majority of that body laid itself open to just criticism for refusing the application of Mr. Carter. It may be reasonably questioned whether any decision of a bench of seven judges ought to stand that is reached by a majority of only one. There are only two conditions upon which such a result can occur. Either the members of the court do not equally comprehend the questions upon which their opinions are divided, or some members of the court are yielding to influences which are extrajudicial. For centuries the English-speaking people have required a unanimous verdict from their juries of twelve men sitting in judgment on questions of fact, and when the twelve do not agree, the presiding judge may, in his discretion, send them back to the jury room for further deliberation to secure unanimity. It is assumed that with further discussion and reflection their comprehension of the question at issue will be equalized. If this policy, so venerable and so cherished wherever it has prevailed, is a sound one, why should it not have its weight with a bench of judges? Why should not the majority be required to convince at least a considerable proportion of the minority, or be convinced by them? Can any case be deemed to have been fully discussed by counsel or adequately considered by a court of seven judges, all having precisely the same law to apply, precisely the same state of facts to apply the law to, and presumably the same degree of concern to interpret that law correctly, when three members of the court, after only a single hearing of counsel, take views precisely the opposite of those entertained by the other four? There is no attribute or function of the judiciary more important than its ability to inspire the public with respect for its decisions. But it is idle to expect that a court of seven judges can retain the respect of the public which declines an application to review a decision reached by the meager majority of one upon grounds not raised, and therefore, of course, not discussed, by counsel on either side. To those who are skilled in interpreting the mystic properties of numbers, I commend the problem presented by the prominent part which the number one has played in the career of Mr. Tilden. At the election of 1876 it was conceded that he lacked but one disputed electoral vote to make him president. When the Electoral Commission was appointed to count the electoral vote, every vital question raised during the deliberations of the commission was decided by a vote of eight to seven, or one majority. When the count of the electoral vote was made final, Rutherford B. Hayes was declared elected, and as a consequence Samuel J. Tilden declared elected to have been defeated on an electoral vote of 185 to 184, or by a majority of one. At the special term of the Supreme Court, the clause of the will by which he disposed of about a third of his large estate was sustained by one judge. On appeal to the Supreme Court in Bank, that disposition was declared invalid by a majority of one. On the appeal to the court of last resort, their decision was confirmed again by a majority of one, 
and finally a re-argument was refused by the same vote as that which had pronounced the 35th clause invalid, and all these decisions in the face of a provision in the will revoking any devise or legacy made in it to any one who should institute any proceedings to invalidate its provisions. Though by the decision of the Court of Appeals none of Mr. Tilden's estate could be claimed by his trustees for the great library which he had so much at heart, measures were taken by the trustees of the Tilden Trust, by which they may reasonably expect to accomplish in a satisfactory way, if not to the extent contemplated by Mr. Tilden, the munificent purpose to which he had to consecrate the bulk of his fortune. In view the uncertainties, expense, and delays incident to litigation of this character, the executors of Mr. Tilden and the trustees of the Tilden Trust deems it prudent, shortly before the final argument in the Court of Appeals, and about six months before its decision was rendered, to accept the terms of a settlement proffered by Mrs. Laura P. Hazard, a grandniece of Mr. Tilden's sister, and under her will became entitled to one half of all that part of the estate that been intended. For the Tilden Trust during the five and a half years occupied by this litigation, the executors, by judicious investments and reinvestments, and by careful attention to doubtful assets, were fortunate enough, not only to protect the estate from any losses, but to add to it about two millions in income and profit, so that at the time of the settlement with the heirs in March, 1892, the general estate, apart from the special trusts, legacies, etc., already referred to, had increased from four millions to six millions of dollars, one half of which, under the arrangement with Mrs. Hazard, came to the Tilden Trust, less the sum of nine hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, which she received for her interest while it was yet subject to the risks of litigation. Of the personal estate something over five and a half millions were distributed in March, 1892. The real estate is still undivided. On the 16th of November 1886, a few weeks after the probate of the will, Mr. L. V. F. Randolph, who had been for many years a director and treasurer of the Illinois Central Railroad, was appointed secretary of the executors and trustees under the will, to the duties of which position were subsequently added those of secretary to the Tilden Trust. On the 23rd day of January, 1893, the trustees of the Tilden Trust, learning that it was contemplated by the municipal government of New York City to remove the old city hall to make place for a larger and more commodious edifice on its site, addressed the following communication to the Municipal Building Committee. The Tilden Trust. 15 Gramercy Park, January 23, 1893. Gentlemen, on the 22nd day of October last I had the honor to submit to the Mayor and Commonalty of the City of New York, on behalf of the trustees of the Tilden Trust, a communication, of which the annexed is a copy and to which tour attention is respectfully invited. It is now rumored that legislation is in contemplation for the removal of the reservoir from Bryant Park, and also for the removal of the old city hall to make place for more spacious and adequate accommodations for the municipal offices. Much as we regret the necessity of disturbing a structure consecrated to us like our city hall by so many precious historical and forensic associations, should such a necessity be found to exist, we respectfully suggest that that admirable structure be transferred to the site now occupied by the reservoir in Bryant Park and appropriated to the uses of the Tilden Trust upon the conditions set forth in the annexed communication. By order of the trustees of the Tilden Trust, John Bigelow, President. The following is a copy of the letter of October 22nd, referred to in the foregoing communication. Office of the Tilden Trust 15 Gramercy Park, New York, October 22, 1893. To the Mayor, Alderman, and Commonalty of the City of New York, the Trustees of the Tilden Trust, incorporated by Chapter 85 of the Laws of the State of New York, passed 21 March 1877, respectfully represent that the late Samuel J. Tilden having in his will, a copy of which is hereunto annexed, made provisions for his heirs at law and certain legatees, sought, by the thirty-fifth article of said instrument, to consecrate the remainder of his estate to the creation of an institution to be known as the Tilden Trust, with capacity to establish and maintain a free library and reading room in the city of New York, and to promote such scientific and educational objects as his executors and trustees might. 
more particularly designate that the validity of the 35th clause of said will was successfully contested by the heirs at law of the testator and pronounce invalid. Pending such litigation, and in view of the uncertainties, expense, and delays incident to litigation of this character, the trustees of the Tilden Trust deemed it prudent, prior to the argument of the case in the Court of Appeals, to accept the terms of a settlement proffered by one of the parties contesting said will, in virtue of which the Tilden Trust became possessed of about one-third of that part of the estate that had been intended by the testator for such trust, from which they expect. To realize from two to two and a quarter million dollars, the annual income from which may be moderately estimated at eighty thousand dollars. That the trustees of the Tilden Trust are anxious to apply this fund in the way that shall prove most advantageous to the people of the City of New York, and at the same time most strictly conform to the wishes and expectations of the testator as manifested in his will. That the income of this trust is insufficient to provide suitable buildings for the accommodation of such a library as was contemplated by the testator, and in addition to equip and operate it if suitable accommodations for its installation are provided from other sources. In view of these facts, and in view of the fact that the city of New York is not only more destitute of library accommodation than any other city of its size in the world, but more destitute than many cities in our own country of far less wealth and population, the undersigned trustees of the Tilden Trust. Respectfully invite your honorable bodies to consider the propriety of availing yourselves of this opportunity of establishing a library commensurate with the magnitude and importance of our commercial metropolis, and taking measure to provide for it the requisite accommodations, with the understanding, to which the trustees of the Tilden Trust hereby avow their readiness to become parties that they will equip and operate such library so soon as such accommodations can be provided. Note, I feel it to be a duty, as it certainly is a pleasure, for me to make a public acknowledgement of his invaluable services in both capacities, and formally to recognize the very substantial obligations under which his varied accomplishments as a business manager, his indefatigable assiduity and his high personal character have placed all who are or may hereafter be in any way interested in this estate. By order of the trustees of the Tilden Trust, John Bigelow, President, October 22, 1892. On the 2nd of May 1893, Governor Flower approved an act passed by legislature authorizing the Commissioners of Public Works, on the request of the Commissioners of Public Buildings, to cause the old City Hall to be removed, re-erected, furnished, and equipped elsewhere upon the property therein, belonging to the mayor, aldermen, and commonality of the city of New York, with the consent of the Department of Public Parks, if such property shall be subject to the jurisdiction of such department. If said building shall be removed and re-erected, the same shall be done in such manner as said Board of Commissioners shall determine, with alterations as may in their judgment be rendered necessary by the site selected and the purpose to which such re-erected building shall be devoted, and as may be in harmony with the present general architectural features of the exterior of said building. On the same day the Governor approved of an act authorizing the Department of Public Works, with the sanction of the Board of Estimate and Apportionment, to remove the reservoir from Bryant Park. On the same day the Governor also approved of an act which authorized the Department of Public Parks to contract with the Tilden Trust for its use and occupation of any building that may be hereafter erected in pursuance of law upon land belonging to the Mayor, Aldermen, and Commonalty of the City of New York between 40th and 42nd Streets and between 5th and 6th Avenues in said city, and establishing and maintaining therein a free library, and carrying out the objects and purposes of said corporation. It was hoped and expected that these measures would result in soon giving to the commercial metropolis of the United States a library commensurate with its magnitude, needs and resources, and thus fitly commemorate its obligations to one of its most eminent citizens and generous benefactors. That prospect, unhappily, has been indefinitely postponed by the repeal of the act authorizing the removal of the old city hall. In what way, if any, the municipal government will give effect to the disposition it manifested in 1893 to provide a suitable structure for the Tilden Library neither the trustees nor the public have as yet any intimation. This concludes Chapter 10. 
Please share, like, subscribe and hit the notification bell.